Welcome back. We are now hearing in the post Bitcoin having era of 2024 that de dollarization continues to accelerate with Russia and China now 90% outside of the dollar when it comes to mutual trade between the countries. How is that going to affect the dollar? How is that going to affect? the world and these markets. That's what we're going to be discussing in today's video, among many other topics, including internet computer secure bridging. We're going to do an update on Goldfinch, the crypto GFI, PayPal, and Gryphon or Gryphon Mining. And uh, we're going to also be talking about other Bitcoin mining companies and kind of where this is all going, because I believe Regardless, if we do have capitulation going forward, we are officially in the bull market after the Bitcoin having period. And there is going to be a lot of room to make money in many different areas that we're going to be talking about in today's video. Nothing I say is financial advice, but we're going to be starting with the dollar, right? We are now 34 and a half, a little bit more than 34 and a half trillion dollars in debt. This has slowed down a little bit, but as you guys know, the overall economy is not doing, you know, super great. We know a lot of businesses are laying people off. The borrowing is kind of slowing down across the board until the Federal Reserve does something. And are they going to do something anytime soon? I believe yes. Guys, the the same thing I said at the top of the 2021 bull market, we don't we won't know that we're in the bear market until we are. So the further we go, the closer we are. And now it's opposite. Now that we're in the post Bitcoin having period of 2024, the, the further we go, the closer we are to just going straight up. So I believe personally for my portfolio and in my strategy that not being in the market is probably not the greatest choice, right? And now, listen, I believe in diversification. So I'm in the market, out of the market. I'm in crypto, I'm not in crypto. I'm in other uh, types of assets. And so their diversification can kind of protect you so that if one area of the market goes down, for instance, crypto, and let's say the stocks go up, well, if you're in stocks and crypto, you may have a little bit of a dip in crypto, but you're going to have a pump in stocks. And so this is how diversification can help out. But meanwhile, Russia and China are boycotting the dollar using their national currencies for over 90% of mutual payments. Now, this is not being widely reported in the United States. I think that just people just don't know about what's going on. And by the way, don't forget to give this video a free thumbs up. Also hit that subscribe button. We upload every single day of the year to bring you the latest happening in the financial world every single day since 2018. I think that deserves a thumbs up at least, if not also a subscribe. Anyway, uh, so yeah, this is not being widely reported in the US and a lot of people in the US, I don't think fully understand the the repercussions of all of these sanctions that the US has been uh, you know, putting on Russia. Right, Russia is still doing business. They still are a country. And so if they're doing businesses with other countries and they can't use the dollar because of sanctions, they're gonna use other currencies. And so Russia and their ally China have almost completely ditched the US dollar to settle bilateral trade, instead using their own currencies, the Yuan and the ruble. According to the Russian foreign minister, more than 90% of mutual payments between the two countries are being done in their national currencies. And so how does this affect the dollar? Well, the more countries that don't use the dollar, they're dumping dollars. And so who are they dumping dollars on? The, the, the people who are using the dollars. It's the same thing in crypto. At the end of the bull market, the people who were in early, they start selling the assets. For instance, Bitcoin top, they're selling the Bitcoin. Granted, the price will start coming down in a bull market, but who are they selling it to? They're selling it to the people who still believe Bitcoin is going to continue to go higher even though we were in a year and a half of a bull market, even though we went 20X in the price of the crypto, there's still people who, oh, no, 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 Bitcoin's gonna go to a bazillion dollars this, in the next month, right? I, I was that way in 2017. I'm sure many of you guys felt that, those feelings at, at, at some point during the, the peak of the market uh, during previous cycles. And so that's literally how markets work, right? An, an asset is valuable and used and held by people. And the less people who hold it and use it, the more the bag holders hold it. And then we, we have a situation where everybody's fleeing the dollar. Like think about Venezuela. And we're going to be talking about Venezuela in this next story because Tether is vowing to freeze assets after Venezuela looks to crypto to bypass oil sanctions. So effectively in Venezuela, they kept printing money at a very exorbitant rate. And every time they printed, they would print more than they printed the previous time. And then it gets out of control so much so that they had hyperinflation. They still have hyperinflation and their, their, their literal physical money is worth is it's not even worth the paper that they printed on. It's literally worthless. And so you'll see, you know, um, 
art being made with this money, the money just thrown on the street because it's literally value less, right? It's kind of like a penny in the United States, right? Yeah, the penny does have value, but it's so minimal. What are you going to buy with a penny? You're going to go collect pennies all day and, you know, maybe have a dollar or two at the end of the day. It's just not worth it, right? And so this is what happens when hyperinflation takes place and or people dump the dollars. And in my view, it's part of the U.S.'s fault because they keep uh, sanctioning these countries and that forces these other countries to leave the dollar. And not only does it force those countries to leave the dollar, it forces the countries that are um, maybe not sanctioned and uh, doing trade with that country to go off the dollar. And we're seeing this happen happening with many different countries right now. And so who is going to be left holding the bag of dollars? Us. Us. You and I, and granted, this could take years and years, but we are seeing the inflation occurring, right? We are seeing the rapid expansion of prices going up, dollar power going down, uh, purchasing power going down. People think they're richer because they're making more from wages, but their wages are not even keeping up with the rate of inflation. So a lot of these businesses slash minimum wage laws, they're literally just pushing everything up. So for instance, if you go to $15 minimum wage or $20 minimum wage, every other position has to be pushed up as well, right? So the managers, the supervisors, the, you know, whoever's not getting paid minimum wage, they're going to get bumped up a little bit as well. Otherwise, what's the point in working a higher level job if you're going to be getting paid the same amount as the early entry uh, worker, right? So that pushes everything up. But the power of the dollar, and people think that they're getting more money and the businesses are like, oh no, we can't afford this, but they're also raising their prices ridiculously and their costs are not going up as much as they're raising it. So it becomes a situation where the dollar is worth less, but people are making more and they think that they're richer, but they're actually less than they were a few years ago because of the rate of inflation. This is very important to understand, especially this is why people talk about Bitcoin being a store of value, right? So if you're going through a hyperinflationary period, yeah, you can convert some of that Bitcoin into dollars. That way you can pay for things and transact and all of that and live. But if you hold it in the Bitcoin, the idea is that Bitcoin is going to outpace that uh, loss of purchasing power. For instance, during the last cycle, a dollar is now worth maybe, you know, 90 cents compared to what it was. Maybe some people would argue even less because of the rate of prices increasing. But let's just say, it lost 10% of its value. So a dollar is now worth 90 cents compared to before the last cycle. Meanwhile, so that's a 50% drop in purchasing power, or sorry, 10% drop in purchasing power. So you'd imagine on the other end, you're getting a 10% increase, but actually you're getting more with Bitcoin because Bitcoin went from $3,000 or even $10,000 at that mid bear market last cycle, all the way up to uh, $70,000, $60,000. Right, that's a 20x, even a 10x, 6x. This is still significantly more than where the rate of inflation was. Anyway, moving on to this story, Tether is now saying that block payments made to sanctioned entities after sources claim Venezuela's state-run oil company is using USDT to facilitate oil exports. So Tether is saying they're going to block these payments. And this comes after a report that uh, Venezuela's state oil company was moving to stable coins to bypass sanctions, to go away from the sanctions because the U.S. is not letting them transact in dollars, something like that. And so Tether says that they respect the OFAC list and it, they're committed to working to ensure sanction addresses are frozen promptly. This comes after the exclusive Reuters report claiming that the state-owned, a state-run oil company PDVSA has been using crypto to facilitate their crude oil and fuel exports um, and that they're facing new oil sanctions reimposed by the U.S. So, I mean, the U.S. is effectively forcing these countries away from the dollar. And so they're going to choose something else, right? They're not just going to disappear. And this is unfortunate because the Americans are going to be left holding the bag. And this is not a very good situation to be in. Um, but we will see. We will definitely see. This as um, we're hearing that credit card delinquency rates are increasing to 2008 levels. That was the financial crisis. This guy who's a research uh, researcher at Bitwise Investments, one of the Bitcoin ETF issuers, and they have some other crypto funds. He said credit card delin delinquency rates at Discover, the credit card company, the sixth largest credit card issuer in the U.S., just spiked to 2008 levels that discover credit card delinquency rates jumped to 5.7% in Q1. For context, delinquency rates into 2022 were at 1.5%. This means that delinquency rates, meaning people who are 
late on their payments, right? They haven't paid their bills. That these rates are nearly four times higher than they were just two years ago. Consumers are still spending at record levels, even as savings have been depleted. Is this the canary in the coal mine of a credit card debt bubble? I think it's really just an overall debt bubble. I mean, guys, I go out to um, eat maybe like a few times a week, not necessarily like super nice restaurants, but also not like at um, like at Applebee's or stuff like that. You know, like nicer, you know, family run businesses, I guess you could say restaurants. And they are all packed. I mean, every day of the week, they are packed. And this is in almost every area that I've been in. And so it's like, we're hearing that the economy is not doing that great. And people are not feeling that they're making enough money. But meanwhile, they're still spending, right? Go to the mall. In the middle of the week, go to the mall. <laughs> it's packed no matter where you are. And so this is an indicator in my view that people are still spending on credit, okay? So we're, the dollar's being devalued. People are just taking out credit. They can't make, they can't afford enough, but they're getting paid more. So they feel richer. So they're spending more, but they're really not because they're, or make, they're really not making more because the purchasing power of the dollar is going down <laughs> and people don't realize that. And so while this is all going on with the dollar, right, we're, we're still battling whether the ETFs are going to be approved for Ethereum and other cryptos, because once Ethereum ETFs are approved, there's going to be more crypto ETFs coming out. And Ethereum ETFs are unlikely to be approved in May, according to a bank standard chartered. And they're yet another financial firm that's saying it's not going to be approved. I personally don't think that the Ethereum ETF is going to be approved. I think this could potentially push the crypto markets further down at least Ethereum further down, maybe bringing us to that capitulation point that I've been uh, talking about on this channel. Maybe not. I mean, maybe we've already capitulated and the capitulation was just significantly less than most of us anticipated, right? I don't know. I mean, personally, I don't think that the market cycles change that often. I, I think that they definitely have rhythm and rhyme, but maybe we're seeing a different super cycle this, this time. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But uh, what do you think? Do you think that the Ethereum ETFs are going to be approved in May? I don't. I think it's going to be an ongoing battle with the SEC once again. And uh, yeah. And meanwhile, XRP, Ripple, they're still fighting with the SEC. <clears throat> I think they have some uh, some uh, like court cases that are wrapping up. But anyway, this user on X who says long-term crypto bull, um, 44,000 users, she said, I am concerned the XRP ledger architects allocated 80 billion XRP to Ripple for the purpose of developing use cases for the digital asset. The XRP ledger launched in June of 2012. How is the ecosystem doing today? Now, first of all, very uh, interesting topic here because what she's going to be talking about is how the effectively the, the XRP treasury funds are being spent and whether they are actually doing anything to advance the XRP network and also advance the usage of XRP. This is the same conversation that we've been having with Cardano over the last two years with the Project Catalyst treasury funding mechanism where uh, Cardano's ecosystem was effectively up to this point over the last few years paying out 50 million ADA every three to four months so that's about um, one to 200 million ADA per year. While the whole network of, of Cardano was inflating by one and a half billion ADA per year. And so this project catalyst was funding these projects that were supposed to be building on Cardano. And here we are in 2024, two cycles after Cardano launched. And we still basically don't have interoperability there. We still don't have cross chain bridges. We don't have smart contract usage on a large scale. I mean, effectively, if you look at the EUTXO transactions, most of the transactions on the Cardano network are just NFTs getting transferred back and forth, which you can set algorithms to do. So it's not actual usage on the network. And this has been a big call out on this channel and for, from me for a long time. And this is one of the reasons I believe Cardano is not investable at this time because there isn't any, um, any pathway to sustainable building on the blockchain through these grants. And Cardano's talking about going into a fully decentralized governance ecosystem, which I don't have much faith in either when they haven't even gotten to the point where they're, I mean, where's all this 200 million ADA over the last few years? Where is it? 
And so what I've explained to my viewers is that in my personal opinion, and that's all it is, I could be wrong. So make sure you guys do your own research and don't just take what I say as gold because I could be wrong. But I believe Cardano and XRP are going to exit the top 10 this cycle. And you could already see, I mean, XRP for most of its existence was in the top five. They want uh, the XRP secondary sales uh, won from an SEC perspective. Nothing happened to the coin, right? And now we're hearing that their funding mechanism, their grant program may not be working either, right? So XRP, no cross-chain communication, no smart contracts, no interoperability bridges, some of the same issues that we have over with Cardano, right? And so let's talk about XRPL grants, she says. We are not privy to any of these submissions or panel discussions held when Ripple developers assess a project's grant application. She says, all I know is merely is, uh, as a mere community member and advocate of XRP, that things are not looking good for the, from a community perspective. She said, let's acknowledge the elephant in the room. Developer activity on the ledger XRPL, I'm just going to say XRP on XRP could be better. We have witnessed a few projects either leaving or acknowledge that they are building cross chain for many reasons. Hmm. Same thing that we hear in Cardano. She says every passing of a new XLS, which is uh, the XRP ledger standard enables new use cases and potentially new exciting projects for the XRP ecosystem. She says, I hope projects will not need to migrate in order to survive, meaning they're going to have to leave the XRP ecosystem to survive. And this is the same thing that we're seeing in Cardano. A lot of projects that were born on Cardano exited to other blockchains. She continues here saying building in Web3 has many challenges. Uh, succinctly put, basic things like setting up a bank account can even be challenging. Banks are weary if the word blockchain or crypto are mentioned. So you can imagine applying for a bank loan. Most distributed ledger technology builders bootstrap their projects in order to realize their business goals and dreams. An issue of trying to build on XRP is that venture capitalists apparently steer clear of such projects, mainly because Ripple is seen as a steward of the XRPL being the largest holder of the digital asset around current uh, 46 billion XRP are currently locked in escrow. And we talk about escrow a lot. Nobody else in the XRP army talks about the escrow where Ripple just keeps selling and selling and selling and selling XRP. And that's part of the reason the XRP price, I believe, has not moved because of this constant selling from Ripple. And what is Ripple doing with that money? She said, I bring this all up because the reality is that XRP, although open source, decentralized blockchain still relies heavily on Ripple for funding. All of the big projects building or associated with XRP are dependent on not only the funding, but the resources that only Ripple can provide, including foundations used to promote and support the ecosystem. For instance, the XRPL Foundation, XRPL Commons, etc. She says the optics are not looking good at the moment when small legit builder grant applications are being rejected without any parent explanation or feedback. Goodwill goes both ways. We'd love to hear the community's thoughts. How can we help improve things and attract and sustain uh, and support builders on the XRP ledger? <clears throat> I mean, when I first read this, guys, I really thought that they were talking about Cardano because all of these issues are the same exact things in the Cardano ecosystem. I mean, we have seen through even Project Catalyst, Cardano builders who are were OGs in the Cardano ecosystem uh, literally saying we're we're done trying to get money from the ecosystem because nobody understood how it worked and nobody understood why big prominent projects weren't getting funded but these like brand new startups that nobody ever heard of nobody knew the team were getting all this funding and again Cardano's usage is almost nothing compared to these major blockchains and XRP in my view is in the same situation they both have this 2017 vibe right where they're trying to do the same things that happened in 2017. It's all about hype. And listen, there's a very high possibility Ripple is going to uh, IPO at some point. And the XRP army is going to be so excited about this. But unfortunately, as Lark Davis says, I believe these two communities have bagitis, where they are not seeing any of this because their bags are so heavy. Oh, everybody loves XRP. No, nobody loves XRP. In fact, just on this channel, we have a very wide reach in crypto. Any video with XRP, worst performing videos. Um, and you can see that the engagement is not there, right? And this is across YouTube. And uh, we're starting to see the same thing happening in Cardano, right? We've talked about this before on my channel. 
that my number one downvoted video is Cardano videos and it's Cardano community that are downvoting it based on our research uh, into some of these things. Like we've done tests on the channel to see like where the downvoting is coming from. And so it, it creates this echo chamber where everybody in the community, which may not be a lot of people, it may just be a few people with a lot of accounts making it seem like there's a lot of engagement. There's just nobody there, right? Nobody's Nobody that joined crypto during 2020 or 2021 or forward are interested in XRP. Why? Because they were in this legal limbo for many years and Ripple did nothing to grow the ecosystem. Like what can XRP do that other blockchains can't? Wow, it's going to be a cross-chain transfer protocol for cross-border payments. Who cares? Polygon can do that. Tether can do that. USDC can do that. Uh, Dogecoin can do that. Ethereum can do that. Every layer two on Ethereum can do that. There's no reason that you need XRP. Now, that Ripple, on the other hand, is a business. So they have these business relationships with countries, with businesses, with back-end integrations of this technology to, to run cross-border payments. But at the end of the day, None of what Ripple is doing necessarily has anything to do with XRP, although they say it could. That's not investable. It could, right? Let's say Elon Musk said, we're, Tesla, we're, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna release any new vehicles until we perfect a vehicle. I mean, that could take centuries, literally. And so what? They just don't push anything out until, they, until they're ready to, uh, you know, have the perfect product. That's completely ridiculous. And so, yeah, I mean, XRP is in this kind of weird situation. Uh, I don't, I don't see how XRP is going to maintain a top 10 position. I mean, it's already basically out of the top 10 and I think it's going to be out very soon, but a crypto that isn't going to be leaving the top 10 and probably is going to enter the top 10. You guys know one of my favorites, Internet Computer Protocol. So this new major milestone for Internet Computer, Internet Computer Canisters or Smart Contracts now serve as a decentralized bridge watchers for the ZK Cross network. So what in the ZK Cross is going on here? Well, ZK Cross posted this at the end of April 2024, said ZK Cross network is proud to unveil our game-changing collaboration with the Internet Computer. We've revolutionizing DeFi interoperability, and this is your first look. They continue saying, we've completed a milestone integration bringing decentralized cross-chain bridge watchers to the ICP canisters. It's a leap forward in achieving true decentralization. What does this mean for you? Think secure, seamless value transfer across Web3 with just one click. You heard that right. The scoop is their bridge watchers are now on chain thanks to internet computer canister smart contracts that's decentralized efficient and as robust as it gets we're talking about rock solid security for your cross chain transactions they said what is live their integration it's in the testing phase ensuring every swap is smooth as silk get ready to experience the future of DeFi with zk cross network and internet computer this is uh, what the integration is unique it's on chain transaction monitoring and true decentralization and don't forget, their approach aligns with the Internet Computer and Dfinity's vision of redefining the decentralized ecosystem. Together, they're not just building bridges, they're building super highways. So integration of ZK Cross DEX on Internet Computer will be next. It's going to be a cross-chain decentralized exchange designed to transform how you move value across Web3. Imagine optimizing value across Web3 with one click, no hassle, no fuss, just seamless integration with a user-friendly experience that's out of the world, this world. That's ZK Cross Dex on Internet Computer. So more is coming uh, on this. Obviously, you guys know that the way that Internet Computer is doing things is very different than what we're seeing with a lot of other ecosystems and blockchains, uh, you know, from their bridgeability using chain key or chain fusion technology to this, right? Integrations with these DEXs that are going to create more cross-chain liquidity and cross-chain compatibility. There are, I mean, guys, everything is not super rosy. I mean, I'm not like, um, th like this is my number one position in my portfolio. It's not. I mean, personally, when I'm recording this video, I don't even hold any ICP at this point. A lot of people have been asking about that. People saying that internet computers paying me. Guys, I don't get paid by anybody except for the people who are members of this channel and you guys watching and I get AdSense from uh, the, the ads on this channel, but I'm not paid by anybody, right? These are my investment um, thesis and strategy. This is what I'm doing in my portfolio. Do I 
believe in internet computer? Absolutely. Do I hold it? Not right this second. And that has nothing to do with the technology. This strictly has to do with where the market is, where the macro market is. As I've explained, we don't know if we've already gotten to the bottom of the market before we're going in the bull market. But as we are moving forward, I do think that we're closer to the, the straight up only in the markets. When that's going to start, nobody knows. And so I believe in diversification. I look at internet computer and part of me says, you know, internet computer has already 8X from the low to the $20 range. It's a pretty big jump and having no corrective phase. But we also have to keep in mind the supply structure of internet computer. The fact that internet computer is one of the only cryptos that hit $800 before it hit $10. Typically it's the other way around. A crypto hits $10 and then $300. Internet computer hit $800, then it hit $600, then it hit $2.90, right? So it actually went opposite where the other assets go. So there's a lot of, as we call it, bag holders that are in with a dollar cost average above six, dollars $700. And so they're kind of stuck. And so maybe the supply situation being limited because people aren't incentivized to sell their coins yet and the fact that there's so much interest in internet computer, maybe internet computer is not going to take a dip. I mean, I'm really waiting for under $10 to rebuy in. I don't know if it's going to hit that, and it may not. But at the end of the day, if we're going to go straight up only regardless, when we're in that phase, does it matter if I buy at $2 or I buy at $10 or I buy at $20? No, because if I bought at $20 and we go to 100, I still made 5x. If I bought at $10 and it goes to 100, I made 10x, right? But we don't we don't know when those numbers are going to hit. So again, part of trading and part of like playing the market is dollar cost averaging in and dollar cost averaging out. And right now, I still think that we're going to see a little bit more of a dip in uh, internet computer. But by the time you're watching this video, maybe not, maybe I already bought. So as I say, don't make investment choices based on what I say, because I could be wrong. And by the time you're watching this, maybe my thesis has changed. Anyway, moving on, PayPal now promotes low carbon Bitcoin mining with a new research paper in a collaboration with Energy Web and DMG Blockchain. They introduced an approach to promote environmentally sustainable practices in Bitcoin mining. The research backed initiative encourages miners to utilize low carbon energy sources by offering financial incentives. And so, yeah, obviously, the financial incentive for these Bitcoin mining companies and these individual Bitcoin miners to use low carbon and low energy or low um, cost energy, this is, I mean, the incentive is already there. Because keep in mind, these Bitcoin mining companies, they have to, they have to spend less than they're earning. And sometimes they don't know how much they're going to make because uh, new Bitcoin fleets pop up, new Bitcoin mining companies pop up, the difficulty increases, like there's so many different scenarios. But there is one company that is already 100% renewable, and that is Gripon or Gryphon Mining. I'm calling it Gryphon. Some of you guys are saying it's wrong. How do you pronounce it? Gryphon, Gryphon? People are saying it's Gryphon, Gripon. Anyway, I'm going to keep saying Gryphon because it's Gry, P-H-O-N, that's Fon, Gryphon. Anyway, I am very bullish on Bitcoin mining companies. I'm actually, I don't know whether I'm more bullish on Bitcoin mining companies or the crypto market itself. I really am not sure. I personally believe that these Bitcoin mining companies are going to do extremely, extremely well. And I could be wrong on this. So make sure you guys do your own research. And by the way, if you're up to this point in the video, don't forget to give the video a free thumbs up. Also hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss a new video. We upload every single day of the year to bring you the latest happening in the financial world. So do me a favor hit the thumbs up button. And if you think that this information is important and valuable and you want to help support the channel financially, click the join button down below to learn more about how you can become a channel member. Thanks to all of our channel members, the people who've been supporting for a short period of time and the people who've been supporting for years right here on the CryptoVisor podcast. Thanks so much for the support. It really does help. Anyway, um, so yeah, this stock I am very bullish on. 100% renewable according to their audits. Their team is fairly new. They have rapid expansion plans and it's a low market cap stock, right? And I, I, in my view, all of the Bitcoin mining companies are going to be minimum billion dollars this cycle at some point, minimum billion dollars. Now I could be wrong on that. I don't, I, I really don't think so. I really don't think, I think it's going to be a, a billion dollars. Sorry. Yeah. Minimum billion dollars. So if we just look at Gryphon mining, it's 52 million. We'll just say 50 million to keep 
the numbers eat round. That's a 20 X. That's a 20 X from where we are today just to get to a billion. And if you think about riot platforms, marathon digital, these are two to $5 billion in valuation. So if Gryphon gets to a $5 billion valuation during the cycle, that's a 1000 X, sorry, no, a 100 X. No, I don't know. Let's do the math right now. 50 million. And we're going to times that by 100. Yeah. 5 billion. So if it goes 100 X, it's going to be at the same market cap of marathon digital in the early cycle. Is that going to happen? I don't know. I think a billion dollars, I think personally that it's baked in. Um, and based on what they're doing from a, you know, uh, perspective of renewable energy, it costs them significantly less money to mine than most companies. Most companies in 2023 were in the 60 and $70,000 range to mine Bitcoin. For them, it was about $18,000. Their, their margins are very large. And they also just announced a stock buyback program. So we know companies that usually do stock buybacks, it elevates the price, limits the supply. Hopefully price goes up. Meanwhile, PayPal, which did this research that we were just talking about on low carbon emission Bitcoin mining, Christopho Chifoy, who is a trading, um, basically a trader who posts on X, he said, I don't like stocks, but I like PayPal. For the first time in two and a half years, the price is consolidating above the 200 day moving average on the daily. It also, the 100 day moving average crosses with the 200 day moving average. This looks so pretty. Look closer, see an inverse head and shoulders, send it to 154 and give me my money. And so I'm not a really big chartist, but an inverse head and shoulders would be a head and shoulders pattern where you have like a, a little bit of a low dip and then a high pump and then a low pump, right? So you got the two shoulders and the head in the middle. So an inverse would be this. There's a shoulder, there's the head, there's the shoulder. Now, typically after these, like the way that I view this, again, I'm not a chartist. So the, the way that I'm explaining it is just my interpretation. But the way that I look at these on a, on a macro scale, let's actually pull up, um, let's pull up PayPal so I could show you on a easier to view chart. So when I zoom out like this, right, it, on the six month, you can see that the trend is up, right? And it, basically the way that I look for trends is this kind of thing. It's like a stairwell. It goes up, it goes up, drops a little bit, goes up, drops a little bit, goes up, drops a little bit. The general trend is higher, even though there's a little bit of a roller coaster in between. Now, uh, again, this is not a candle chart, so it's not as easy to see what he's saying um, with the head and shoulders. But, uh, and by the way, he's also looking at the daily. I don't know what this is at. So anyway, it doesn't matter. When I zoom out, what I really want to look for is, again, that trend. So when I pull this out, and you can see that it looks like the bottom was October 2023, which it was for most of the market in crypto. And we saw crypto basically go much higher than this in terms of growth. Uh, I think that we can actually compare this to, let's see if we can compare it to Bitcoin. Yeah, we can. So yeah, you can see that PayPal was basically flat and in the negative over the last one year compared to Bitcoin, which is up 141%. And so uh, even up on the, the year to date, you can see PayPal basically flat. So we've had basically uh, very little movement in the price of PayPal, uh, but the trend has been higher. And when we zoom out, there's this huge gap, double gap that needs to be filled here, right? We saw this huge drop in July of 2023, where it went from $75 to $60. Over here in May, it went from $75 down to $60. So those are big drops. And so typically, when you're starting to reverse the trend, you're going to see these kind of things happening upside down. Not 100%, uh, basically meaning instead of going down, we're going to go higher here. When that's going to happen, I don't know. But when you look at a, a more tradable chart with the bars and the candles here, this is much easier to see kind of where the trend is. Look at the flows of volume, right? Look at the moving averages. You can see here the blue line, um, I think it's the 50 day moving average. And what is the 200 day moving average? It basically shows you the average and you can kind of see where, I think it's up here. 
yeah, you can see the cross here. I think he's showing this for volume. I think that's what it is. I don't even know what the bottom is. But this top here, you can see that the moving average right here is crossing the other two moving averages. And usually when you see convergence like that, it's the beginning of a trend either to the upside or to the downside. Now, the fact that we're entering a bull market, in my view, the fact that PayPal does have crypto integrations and payments, keep in mind, payments on PayPal are usually like small businesses. So if small businesses are not doing that well, they're not getting loans, they're not borrowing money, they're not really expanding or spending money, you're going to see PayPal's usage decrease and therefore their profits decrease. If all this turns around and we start to see more money being pumped into the ecosystem and the Federal Reserve changing course, potentially we're going to see a lot more movement in these uh, in these prices of things. So anyway, we're also hearing not just about Gryphon Mining doing stock buybacks, but Canaan executives are seeking to buy at least $2 million in the company's shares following the halving. Now, a lot of people don't know about this company, but Canaan is a, a stock that's traded on the NASDAQ, $241 million. It's described as doing business as Canaan Creative, known as simply as Canaan, is a China-based computer hardware manufacturer established in 2013. They specialize in blockchain servers and ASIC mini uh, microprocessors for use in Bitcoin mining. So uh, yeah, they're, they're looking to buy $2 million, which is really only 1% of the stock's market cap, but that's still a pretty big number. And again, they're doing this post having. I'm buying Bitcoin stocks post having. And I think that we're going to see extremely good performance from these because again, right there, the whole narrative about Bitcoin and the Bitcoin having in crypto all comes down to the Bitcoin mining cycle, the Bitcoin having. And who does the Bitcoin having benefit the most? Bitcoin mining companies. Anyway, moving right along, Goldfinch posted this saying, as members of the Tokenized Asset Coalition, we applaud the innovative steps towards tokenization and finance. Education and advocacy are key to navigating this terrain. Together, we can build a more financial, uh, inclusive financial ecosystem. And they link to this article that basically talks about the next frontier. And they talk about uh, tokenization. It says the movement is known as tokenization, which proponents argue will streamline the exchange of various real world assets by tracking them on ledgers that underpin cryptocurrencies. It's a trend that's beginning to raise a host of new policy questions for Washington beyond the dramatic day to day battles. And so, you know, BlackRock just recently launched a tokenized fund. We're hearing a lot more about this tokenization of real world assets. And Goldfinch is well positioned for this, right? Because they have a, a collateralized loan program on their ecosystem. Now, a lot of people have been asking me for updates on Goldfinch. Am I still bullish on Goldfinch? I mean, for the most part, yes. Unless I make a video that says I'm bearish on these coins, most of them that I'm bullish on, I'm going to be bullish on the whole cycle. We're having a little bit of a dip now. Uh, I think I sold all my Goldfinch. I took profits out of, the, uh, out of it. Because again, Goldfinch went from 38 cents to over $4, over $5 at some point. So it more than, uh, it more than 10 x in the value. And so when you see these 10 X's and you're like, oh no, we're going higher, I'm just gonna hold. It's like, you, you can definitely do that. But there's a lot of people that are gonna be taking profits this entire cycle. Um, so again, I mean, if you are comfortable in the, in the market and non-emotional, maybe you have a trading account and a holding account. That way you can trade in one and just hold in the other. But generally speaking, I think it's going much higher. There are some concerns about Goldfinch, specifically um, the fact that they've had a few loan defaults, including a recent one. And if that continues, these loan defaults, it, I mean, this could be really bad. But that I don't think we necessarily have to worry about at the beginning of a bull run. We definitely have to think about it at the end of a bull run because think, remember what happened with FTX, BlockFi, all of them. That was all loaning and borrowing to and from each other, just creating endless money. And when that mechanism stopped, everything crashed, everything. And so, yeah, I am worried about the, how that loan situation is going to play out, especially in future loans that they provide, because I would imagine they're going to be creating more loans. But remember, they do have some pretty big backers, including Circle and Coinbase. So with that, I hopefully you guys enjoyed today's video. I'm doing a few of these longer style videos to really break down what I'm talking about and everything doesn't feel rushed because I know a lot of you guys are trying to navigate this market the same way that uh, I am, the same way that many other viewers are trying to as well. It's a very complicated market. Nothing is guaranteed. We don't 
can't like predict 100% that something's going to or not going to happen in the markets. So a lot of it comes to diversification and figuring out what is the most likely scenario and really taking the risk. Most people, they're just scared to, they're like, they under, guys, there's people who watch my videos that have never invested in this stuff, right? They're, they're scared. They don't know what to do. Even, even myself, right? I, it is a very hard thing to press that buy button on a, on a crypto or on a stock. I mean, ultimately you have to start, right? I mean, uh, my first large purchase of crypto, I mean, it was scary. And obviously I was very early in my uh, investing journey and I lost a lot of money on that trade. I think one trade I made, it was supposed to be for long-term hold and I bought it and the next day it cratered by like 50% and <laughs> I was devastated, devastated. And so, yeah, there, uh, all I will say is there's going to be a lot of people who leave this cycle with no profits. In fact, a lot of people are going to leave in the negative. So make sure that you put money aside to pay your taxes. Make sure that you don't retrade all of your profits because if you retrade all your profits and then you get in the red again, it's very hard to come out of that, especially once the bull market is over. And so with that, hopefully you guys enjoyed. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss a new video. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. Crypto on.